Hello, fellow rebel capitalists. Hope you're well. Welcome to this weekend's public live stream. I'm here in Medellin, Colombia, just enjoying every single minute of it. Before we get things going, I want to remind you to check out Rebel Capitalist Live. We just booked the hotel, so I'm super stoked. Last weekend in June, Miami, got tons of great speakers. We're going to be adding speakers pretty much every month. So Incredible, incredible people that are going to absolutely blow you away. So check that out at rebelcapitalistlive.com. Let's get into your questions. What do we have this evening? I don't know why there's that glow around my face. That's really weird. I think it's these lights behind me. I got to leave the lights like that for the whiteboard. You can see right there. I, I can't mess with them at all <laughs> because it's so hard to get them right without whiteboards. So we'll just have to roll with it. Okay. Is an inflationary deleveraging and a deflationary deleveraging mutually exclusive? This is a good question. In other words, can they both? Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, I think this 1970s, good example of that from 72 to 74. So you had a uh, deflationary deleveraging in, in stocks. They went down by 50% in nominal terms. While at the same time, you're getting an inflationary deleveraging in the real economy with, with other debt, um, like consumer debt, sovereign debt, because nominal GDP was going up uh, to a significant degree. So, yeah, it all depends on, I mean, it's just like the the, the dollar and the and CPI. And, you know, a lot of people think that if we get inflation, that means that the dollar's tanking. And not really. The do against what? That's the question. Very nuanced. Is the dollar tanking against real estate? Is it tanking against stocks? Is it tanking against the stuff that you buy daily? Because those don't necessarily happen at the same time. They're, they aren't really tied at the hip. They can be, uh, but they're. It, it doesn't. It, one, if one goes one way it doesn't carry the other one with it i think that's probably the best way to say it so uh you can see this with the dxy i mean look at the dxy from 2000 call it 2000 right top of my head 2008 right at the end of 2008 uh it was at maybe 70 so that's the dollar against the, the euro uh basket of currencies but it's 57 percent euro and today it's at 95, 96. And in 2008, it was at 70, call it five. So question, has uh, the dollar lost value compared to stocks during that time? Absolutely. Has the dollar lost value compared to consumer goods and services? Sure, but it's gained value against the euro, and against a, a majority of other fiat currencies. So yeah. The, it's a it's a great point, Joel. It's, it's just it's cross currents, right? There's always cross currents moving, and we just have to determine which cross currents are going to overpower some. But uh, that said, there are certain things that can happen simultaneously uh, in different areas, whether it's consumer prices, uh, fiat currencies, or assets, stocks, housing, gold, commodities, etc. And look at oil. We have oil gone the last couple of days, probably still over 90. Uh, while at the same time, you've had other commodities go down. A lumber's gone way up, then way down, way back up. I mean, it's on a roller coaster ride. So there's lots of volatility, and nothing ever goes up in a straight line. And that's if you guys watched the whiteboard video that I did the other day, that was really controversial. I don't really see why, but um, people just completely lost their minds because I was saying that my base case is that although we're in an inflationary environment, there's no doubt about that. Uh, I thought that inflation might go, the CP is measured by the CPI, might go down uh, maybe Q3, Q4, and then uh, it all depends on government deficit spending and uh, you know how badly they screw up the supply chains and uh, it will not by, by then i'm sure we'll get one it's not a matter of if but when 
But then there's a lot of factors that go into it. You know, will the Fed, will the government backstop debts? So commercial banks start to lending, creating more dollars circulating in the real economy. That's another unknown. Um, but that was kind of my base case. And uh, not that we go into deflation, not at all. But CPI might go from 7.5 up to maybe 8 or, uh, you know, low 8s, 8.5. And then Q3, Q4 come back down to 7.5 or 6.5, something like that, maybe 5. And, uh, you know, I think I gave a pretty good argument for it. It's pretty straightforward. And uh, people just completely freaked out because it's, it's very difficult, I've noticed, for people to hold two opposing views simultaneously for whatever reason. So the fact that you're able to do that, hats off to you. And, uh, but my, my short answer is, is yes, I think that can happen. And then, you know, um, if you look at the 1940s, you know, again, what's your time frame, Joel? You know, is it 10 years or is it a year? If you look at the 1940s, you actually had huge inflation, 19% at one point. And then the next couple of years, you had deflation, with a D, actual deflation, not just disinflation, deflation. And uh, crazy, crazy stuff. So that, that's another factor in there. But um, always keep in mind, guys, that what I've, one of the main things that I've learned in trying to uh, do the best that I can to express my views and try to think through things through the whiteboard videos and on the live streams and in the interviews, uh, I've noticed that um, sometimes the reason it's so hard to educate people isn't necessarily because they are uneducated. Um, it's because they're, they, as I said, you know, they're not suffering from ignorance, they're suffering from cognitive dissonance. So what I mean by that, and you can tell just by the, the comments from that video the other day, people get emotionally tied to a narrative and i think that it's because they set up their portfolio for that narrative to come true and therefore they tie their net worth to the narrative therefore anything that combats the narrative gives them extreme levels of cognitive dissonance so they have to try to rationalize that away even though what they're saying makes no sense, or even if they completely ignore uh, what I'm actually saying in a video. So the takeaway there is don't let yourself fall prey to that uh, psychological hardwiring that, that human beings have. And unfortunately, we are emotional creatures at the end of the day. And that can be a very, very good thing, but not investing or not in investing. So. Um, I guess use that as a cautionary tale. Yes. Have I talked to Lynette about her prediction and in inflation? Seems to think it's it's rising even faster pace than you think. Um, I, I don't mean to put down your question there, but again, and, and you know, if you guys listen to, to Schiff is another one that, that People would say, oh, well, George, looks like you disagree with Peter. No, just, you got to listen. You got to listen. You got to listen to what these people are saying. And I have never, in fact, Lynette was at our last mastermind group meetup in Naples, Florida. I spent the entire weekend there. And um, we had some great discussions. And in fact, she was there speaking with Jeff Snyder. So you want to talk about someone who uh, people might think has a differing view and their views, they, they really don't differ too much. The only thing that differs is time frame. You know, Lynette and, and Peter say, you know, they talk about inflation, inflation, inflation. Uh, you know, you've got to own gold. This is very true. This is very true. But it doesn't necessarily mean that inflation goes from 7.5% to 10%. 20% to 40% to 2000%. You see, that's what people think they mean. And no, look at all inflation. Look at inflation throughout history. Look at Weimar, Germany. It, that's not the way it works. <laughs> it doesn't go up every single month. 
uh, it sometimes it, it takes a little bit of a breather. It goes from uh, 7.5, let's say, to 8, down to 6.5, then back up to 7.5, then up to 9, then up to 10, then 11, and then back down to 10. And he's just it's common sense stuff. And even Peter, you, you heard on his last podcast, he said um, he, he was talking about um, throughout the rest of 2020 that inflation might even go down. Even Peter says, sure, it might go down, but it's still going to be at a high level. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that doesn't mean that it goes just up in a straight line. It's it's like people, and again, I, I, I want to dive into this because it's a cautionary tale. And we can't allow ourselves to, to think in binary terms. And so, and, and that's what I've noticed uh, so many people do. Um, you know, what you do is, is, is it's like you, you make up your mind and I'm not talking about, you know, you personally, I'm just talking about people in general. Um, people make up their mind as to if someone is an inflationist or a deflationist, that's it. You have to choose binary, black or white, choose, choose a team. And what you'll notice is this is what it turns into, whether it's gold, Bitcoin, Inflation, deflation, Democrat, Republican, turns into a religion. That, that is not how you become a good investor. You have to be incredibly agnostic uh, about this stuff. And uh, my point is, is people just pick a team and then they just assume that inflation means up in a straight line. Deflation means down in a straight line. All about CPI. No. No, 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 no. That 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 is not what what happens here. So, as an example, you know, I've talked about um, thinking that my base case is we get inflation, and I, this goes back to 2019. I mean, you guys know this from watching my videos. That we get inflation, and if we have a, a asset bubble crash, then yeah, I mean, we get some disinflation probably, then go up in a straight line. But we go into an inflationary period. It would be very surprising to me. If the the CPI actually went negative uh, for more than a quarter or, or two, even with a massive stock market crash, because it would affect the supply side so dramatically, and that's that's been my view for a long, long time. But for some reason, I come out and say that yes, inflation is going to stay hot, but it might go down a little bit in Q3, Q4. And then depending on the government, sure, they'll most likely come in and do a CARES Act 2.0. And then inflation goes right back up. But for some reason, people freak out. And they say, oh my gosh, George is a deflationist now. He's changing his tune. He needs to apologize for all those whiteboard videos he did about inflation. What? What are you talking about? You see, I totally agree with Peter and Lynette uh, over the long run. And by the way, so does Snyder. And, and so would Lacey Hunt. So would so, so would uh, Brent Johnson. Yes, the, the dollar is not going to be the reserve currency forever. That that is very true. And and will we go into a, a long period, most likely of inflation and maybe interest rates uh, going into a, uh, I should say, bonds going into a bear market? We've had a bear a bond bull market for forty years plus. Will we go into a bond bear market? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. But it doesn't mean that it happens in the next year uh, that we go from 7.5% inflation to 40. It doesn't mean that the dollar loses reserve currency status in the next two months. And, you know, I, I think a lot of it has to do with people that, um, uh, well, I, I I won't go into it any further because I don't want to throw anyone under the bus. But you, you've got to look at time horizon here, right? It's people who believe that long term will have inflation. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that they think inflation is going to skyrocket in the next week. I, I just think about that for a moment. Just think if you had a long term view on gold, right? And you have a long-term view on gold that it's going to—it's prudent to own. It'll most likely maintain its purchasing power. And let's say that we have a, a month, uh, just a, a month over month, 
CPI goes up by 1%. And let's just say that gold is flat that month. Would, would you absolutely lose your mind and say, oh my gosh, gold doesn't work anymore. It's not an inflation hedge. Oh, this is, this is terrible. Of the past 5,000 years, it's done. It's over. Put a fork in it. It's done. No, you'd simply say, it's just one month. It's, I don't hold gold just because I think it'll go exactly one direction and be you know, tied at the hip every single minute to the CPI. But I know that over the long run, over three, five years, it's going to maintain its purchasing power. You don't know what it's going to do from day to day. So if you come out and if you have a view that, hey, maybe gold is a little overbought, so I, I would hold off a little bit, maybe for the next month or so, see if it cools down, then add to your position. That does not mean that you're a gold bear. It just means that what time frame are we talking about? So when you're listening to someone like Lynette, someone like Peter, someone like Lynn, uh, someone like Luke or Brent or, uh, or Jeff or any of these people, um, you've got to ask yourself, okay, what are they saying? And then what are they referring to specifically if they're talking about inflation? The dollar against what? Are they talking about global economic growth? Are they talking about the U.S. domestic economy? Are they talking about emerging markets? You know, what specifically are we talking about? And then what are we talking about as far as time frame? Are we talking about the next three months? Are we talking about the next three weeks? Are we talking about the next three years? You see, this is what we've got to do if we truly want to understand what these people are saying. And unfortunately, people just, they, they want a quick and easy way to uh, compartmentalize everyone into a team. And so I can determine quickly whether this person is on my team or they're not. And if, they're, if they don't say exactly what I want them to say every single time I listen to them, then they're not on my team and I hate them. <laughs> See, that's emotion. And that's what we want to completely eliminate possible from our investment framework and from our investment strategies. Comment, there are some writings about the first Great Depression and how immigration coincided with its resolve. Found that interesting. I haven't read anything like that. I, I have not read anything like that. Part, part of what's tough about uh, immigration, Wayne, is, is it's, it's not all created equal. As an example, I think there was a selection product. Let's go back to like the 1800s where uh, we really pretty much had open borders, let's say, or back to a time in the United States when we pretty much had open borders. Um, we did not have welfare. We, we did not have social security. We, we did not have, you're on your own. I mean, if you can't make it, you can't make a buck, you're, you're, you're quite literally dead. Uh, there is big, big risks by coming to the United States. Not only, not to mention that. I mean, if you go back uh, even you know a couple hundred years, um, it was dangerous to even come here, to even cross the ocean to get here. <laughs> and so it's like you risk your life to cross the ocean to get here, and then once you get here, then you're still screwed. Then then you might not know the language. You're dirt broke. You have no skills. You have no place to live. You, you got nothing. You're just, you're on your own. And people, so you, you got to think about the type of person that would risk their lives to come here and then start with absolutely nothing and know that they're not going to get anything given to them. Nothing. Zero. That's a, a, a unique type of guy or gal, let's say. So if every single person coming into the country falls into that category, um, 
yeah, that's going to be pretty darn good <laughs> for GDP growth because those people are going to hustle. They're going to create goods and services. They're, they're going to, they're going to, you know, they're going to be motivated. They're going to be risk takers. Uh, they're going to value freedom far more than safety. That that's for sure. So, uh, you know, nowadays, uh, do we, when, when we allow people to come into the country, is it under the same condition? Now, I'm not saying, I don't know what the condition was in uh, the 1930s, Wayne. Uh, my guess it would be, I mean, listen, 1930s, we didn't have Social Security. Uh, we didn't have minimum wage. We didn't have welfare, really, with some kind of, you know, some things like that started around the mid-1930s. But, um, you know, not to the same degree that we have today, obviously. And I don't know that people expected that either. Uh, you know, you hear all these stories about the Great Depression when uh, people were embarrassed to take welfare and actually paid it back. Uh, imagine someone paying back their stimmy checks today. Uh, just, just imagine that. So I think... Uh, a much different environment for uh, immigration. I don't know if that would bail us out again, if we're measuring wealth by an increase in society's ability to, to produce goods and services. If we didn't have the minimum wage, that'd be a different story because now all of a sudden we can start uh, producing things at a reasonable rate here that Americans could actually afford. You know, Americans always say, oh, we want jobs to come back home and we want jobs, 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 and we don't, don't, don't want to uh, sub out everything to China. That's fine. I, I get it. I get it. Uh, you don't want to be held hostage by China. But um, there, there's, there's a trade-off there that most people don't consider. They think that if we had all those jobs back in the United States, oh my gosh, it'd just be amazing and there's no downside and it's just all upside. Just if you think we have inflation now, just wait till all those items that you buy in Walmart and Home Depot and Lowe's, just wait till those are manufactured with all of our regulations, manufactured at $15, $20 an hour wages. Just see what happens to prices then. I'm telling you. There are no solutions, as Thomas Sowell teaches us. There are only trade-offs. So my point there is maybe it is, a, a, on net balance, a good thing, but we have to understand that it's a trade-off. And what most people do is they only see the benefit and they completely ignore the cost uh, with economics, just like they do with the Cervasa sickness. Exact same thing. Here's my buddy. I'm not going to mention his name, but I I, I hope he's doing well. He, he knows who I'm talking about. Uh, what is the gambling market like in Colombia? Latin America is very different than Asia. Europe, North America has common uh, Colombian place to bet. In yeah, it's, it's definitely not like Asia. I mean, Asia, that's really the national pastime is gambling. Uh, Europe, they're heavy, heavy, heavy duty sports bettors uh, to a certain degree, North America. Australia, which my good friend here knows well, uh, they're far more into sports betting. Not too much in Colombia from what I've seen. I don't even know. You know, I've been to a lot of the soccer games here, a lot of the big, big matches in Medellin, and I have never seen an ad for like a betting company or, or website. Um, so it may exist, but it, it's, it's not, uh, it, it's definitely not a national pastime like it is in Asia. CBDC may start by replacing current benefits card with the Fed card. Eventually, I see two economic systems in such a scenario. Otherwise, all non-CBDC transactions would have to be banned. No, 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 no. No, I, I don't. I don't agree with that. You just look. We have the next downturn. Uh, they need to get money injected into the system. And uh, 
they say, hey, you need to download your Fed app. And then on your Fed app, you get Fed coins. Uh, they are denominated in dollars. And the merchant is going to have a, an account with the Fed as well. Maybe they keep their account with their local bank. And um, you just can pay with your debit card or you can pay with Fed bucks, Fed coin. Um, it's, it's denominated in dollars. It's, it's, but, uh, there's not two ecosystems. There's not two uh, economic systems. It's all the same thing. It's just, uh, you know, it, it's basically, it's like saying that, that if we have cash and debit cards, there's two completely different economic systems. Well, not really, not really. Same thing. Just it, it's either an electronic payment that's denominated in dollars or it's physical dollars, green pieces of paper that are in your back pocket. Um, Fedcoin would be an electronic payment system that was denominated in dollars, just like the, the, the current banking system. The, the only difference is that instead of uh, you banking with Wells Fargo or Bank of America, you just bank with the Fed. And you probably have two accounts, one with Wells Fargo and one with the Fed. Uh, just like now, you may have two accounts, one with Chase and one with your local community bank or something at, at surface level it's it's identical where it really changes is on the back end and the fact that uh, because now all of those uh, quote unquote dollars are liabilities of the fed and uh, they're they're some or uh, a percentage maybe are still with the commercial banking system but that's the big difference it's our is the, is the liability or is the, are the dollars liabilities of the Fed or the commercial banking system? And I could go on for the next hour on the differences there. But at surface level, like how that would affect the average Joe and Jane and how they make purchases, transactions, how that would affect businesses in, in just the way they transact. I mean, it's going to affect them in a lot of ways, trust me. Um, but just the way they transact and make payments and accept payments, it's the exact same. Okay, guys, just, if you're putting in a question, just make sure you start with question. That helps me see it. If it's in capital letters, it's even better. A best book to learn about economic cycles? Probably Dalio. I'd say Dalio or Fourth Turning. But economic cycles specifically, probably Dalio. And then, uh, let's see, what would be a... I haven't read any Austrian books on, on business cycle theory. But obviously, I know there's got to be a lot of really, really good ones. But I don't know that you need to read a book on that. You can just read some good blog posts at, uh, at, at on the Mises uh, website. Uh, is it Mises.org, I think. That's the one that, uh, oh, who is it that runs that? I, I really like the guy that runs that. It's um, He always does shows with Tom Woods. Oh, what is his name? Uh, that's you guys know what his name is. It's uh, um, ah, geez. anyway, put it in the chat so I'm not uh, drives me crazy. But uh, the guy that that runs and started, I think Mises.org. Uh, I'll think of his name in a second. Lou Rockwell. You know, for some reason, I, I'm terrible with names. With numbers, I'm, I'm, I literally remember my phone number from like when I was in third grade. I can still remember my phone number. Uh, it, it was 6450550. But for some reason, with names, I'm just, I'm terrible memorizing names. I've always been like that. Question is, forced masks, masking and school closures pave way for national school choice. The money follows a student follow-up. How will the forced mask gen? I don't know, Melissa. These are great, great questions, and I'm probably not qualified to answer them because I don't have any kids. And um, I don't know. I think this would be 
state to oh, national school choice. I don't know. I'm sorry, Melissa. That, that that's not my. Uh, I haven't followed that very closely. Although it's obviously a massively important topic. I think that uh, what the, the problems that kids will have as a result of wearing masks. You know, the kids that are past like five, six, seven years old, I think they're fine. And obviously, I don't know. I'm just going off what I've heard from uh, Brett Weinstein and his wife, Heather. I think they've really gone into the details and the nitty gritty. So I'm just uh, kind of reiterating what I've heard them say. But, uh, you know, when you put a, a mask on a kid that's, that where their brain is developing at such a rapid rate, you know, say two, three, four years old, something like that, when you put a mask on them where they can't see adult faces, they can't see their own, they can't see the faces, there's going to be a lot of problems how can there not be for heaven's sakes when you think about how how communicate communicative we are through our uh, facial expressions you know, even the, even me you know i'm not that animated of a person but um just think about watching even this live stream or one of my whiteboard videos if i was just completely stone face you, you wouldn't have um i think about how much would be lost in uh my or anyone's ability to communicate if they couldn't use facial expressions or you couldn't read those facial expressions and my guess is uh, you know we don't come out of the womb with that understanding <laughs> we learn that when we're you know two three years old or four years old or whatever and if these kids are having to wear masks that's just uh, wow and you want to it just goes right back to a cost benefit analysis melissa i'm sure i don't have to tell you this but you know what's the benefit of having a kid wear a mask zero zero especially a cloth mask i mean come on and we've gotten to the point now where that's been completely debunked that cloth everyone knows even the cdc admits that cloth masks are not that effective at all and uh then and everyone knows that the probability of a young person even getting the surveys of sickness yet a, let yet alone having a problem with it at three or four is just absolutely minuscule it, it's minuscule in fact they have more of a problem with the flu so uh, it, it's just uh, the fact that anyone would even suggest that is um i think child abuse but um again i, I don't want to go too far off on a tangent there because i will admit that that is not my area of expertise and i haven't put much uh, thought or research into that Do you think that removing the federal gas tax temporarily could cause short-term shortages as people scramble to buy? Uh, I don't know if we're at that point. We're, we're talking about Gresham's law really kicking in there. I do totally agree with Schiff's take that it's just so hypocritical that it shows you that these politicians, and I've been, as you guys know, I've been saying this for how long now? That politicians, the World Economic Forum, the global elite, they don't care about climate change. They don't care about climate change at all. If you think, if you're a big greenie, and uh, if you are more power to you, but if you think that uh, the World Economic Forum is on your team, uh, you're lying to yourself, like I say, more than they lie to you to get your vote or your support in the first place. Not a chance. They're just using this as a Trojan horse to usurp power and control. They, do, they don't care about the planet. They don't care about air. You know, they don't care about the, the temperatures going up two degrees in the ocean. It's, it's just all theatrics is what it is. And if you ever wanted proof of that, look at the gas tax. Because it's, it's very well known. I mean, it's, it's economics 101, for heaven's sakes. If, if you want to reduce demand, what do you do? You increase price. <laughs> you want everyone to go to an electric car? Make gas $400 a gallon. And, and everyone's going to be driving an electric car really, really fast. <laughs> and then you save the planet. Woohoo! Good job. Right? So if you're a, a Greta Thornburg type, or whatever her name is, little Greta, 
if you if you're one of those types, you want a gas tax. In fact, you want a, a higher gas tax. You want higher gas prices. And so it just shows you that the Democrats are just they're desperate. They're just desperate for a way to try to buy votes. And they it's it's just such a scam. It just it drives me crazy. And it what really drives me crazy is people actually trust them. How can you trust these people? Is it not obvious that they're lying to you? But again, you know, it goes back to what we were talking about at the beginning of the live stream. The people don't care. They they just they don't care if someone lies to them, as long as they're on their team. You know, if you're on the inflation team, it doesn't matter what someone says. It doesn't matter if you like them. It doesn't matter if, if it, it, nothing matters about them, just as long as they say the right things and they're on your team. It, it's just, it's bizarre. And it's the same thing with Fauci. It's the same thing with Biden. It's the same thing with Republicans too. It, it's just, it, no matter how, morally uh, bankrupt an individual is. It doesn't matter if they're on your team and you got their back. Craziness, craziness. Does it make sense to sell real estate, entry-level homes? Boy, Carl, that's a tough question, man. That's a tough question. It's really individual. If you're an expert, if you're Jason Hartman, probably not. Because you're going to be have perfect leverage. You're going to have a 30-year fixed rate debt. You're going to be in great neighborhoods. You would have bought them at, at, at good prices, great positive cash flow, great schools, districts, you know, all these things. You're going to be... You're a pro, you're an expert. Now, if you're just uh, new to the game and you've never done this and you've never went through a GFC type of event and uh, this is your last penny and, and you know, you're making 20 or 30 grand a year, that's a different set of uh, risk rewards, I think. Uh, it doesn't make sense to sell. So this, this would imply you already own it. I, and I don't know. I don't know if you have fixed rate debt. I don't know what your job looks like. I don't know how secure your job is. I don't know if it's positive cash flow. I don't know if it's in a good area. I don't know if it's in a cyclical market. I don't know if it's in a, a, a linear market. I don't know what your RV ratios are. <laughs> you see where I'm going with this? <laughs> uh, I, I can't just, uh, the only thing I can say definitively, Carlos, is I would much, much, much rather own an entry level home right now than uh, an $800,000 home that builders can still build at a profit. That's one thing I can say. Here's another. All right, let's let's so the Fed will raise rates, but over time to what 2.5%? What does that help when inflation is more like 15%? Right. So you're talking about positive real rates. Yeah. I get it. <laughs> I get it. Eric, did we have positive real rates in the 1940s? In fact, let's do this, guys. I saw a chart today that I think may be one of the best charts I've ever seen. I was completely blown away by this chart. Let's see if I've got it here. I'll do a screen share. Yeah, here we go. So let's do this screen share and let's go to look at this chart. I mean, can you, have you ever seen a chart with more data? Hopefully you guys can see. Let me make sure that this is screen sharing. Yeah, it is. Okay. So what I look at this. So this is a, by the way, this is investmentoffice.com. Observations, market in history, visual history of the Federal Reserve System, 1914 to 2009. Just incredible amounts of data on this. So we start off here 
1915 to 1936. This is showing the Fed's balance sheet, the size, the composition. It's showing CPI. It's showing what Fed funds. I mean, pretty much every single data point that you could imagine all on one chart. And it flows from left uh, to right and then down from right to left. And it shows the assets and the liabilities of the Fed's balance sheet. So let's go down here to uh, 1945. So right here, I don't know if you guys can see this, but we've got these green dotted lines. This is inflation, okay? So let's, we, we had three spikes of inflation in the 1940s and then going into the early 1950s. And you can see this, this the largest spike we got went way higher than inflation was even in the 1970s. This was at 19.5%. CPI, CPI was 19.5%. We call it 1947, okay? But then we go back here and we see that, uh, as most of you know, the, the Fed funds rate was, uh, not only the Fed funds was pegged, but the whole yield curve was pegged all the way out. And I think the long bond, 30, was pegged at 2.5%. In fact, I'm, I'm almost positive, 99% positive, uh, at 2.5%. So let's think about this. The long bond was pegged, at, and obviously short bonds were, were pegged at a much lower interest rate. I believe that definitely under 1%. I can't remember it was like 50 basis points, something like that. Just think about that, that even the 30 years at 2.5 and inflation is at 19.5%. That that is unfathomable negative real yield. And you say, oh, yeah, George, of course, the Fed was pegging the yield curve. Right, what, what do you expect? Okay, well, how would the Fed peg the curve? They'd have to buy bonds, right? Well, look at this. Look at the, what happened to their balance sheet. From call it 1945-ish, the middle of 1945, to 1951, when they actually lifted the peg. The Fed's balance sheet actually went down. And so we had a little bit of a bump right here, but nothing major, right? What does this tell you? This tells you that the Fed wasn't buying that many bonds. In other words, they didn't need to buy that many bonds to keep the 30-year pegged at 2.5%. And you'll notice that there are some times in here, and I don't, I'm sure that's on this chart somewhere, but where the uh, the 30-year traded under 2.5%, while the Fed really wasn't having to do anything with their balance sheet. So what this tells you, at least during this time frame, is that even if the Fed wasn't doing quantitative easing, I don't know if rates would have been that high. Maybe they would have got up to three, four percent, but I can't see how they would have been uh, higher than nineteen point five, which was the rate of inflation. You see, and then of course you had a a, a recession in nineteen forty nine, and so going. First of all, you guys have to check out this chart. That chart is absolutely mind-boggling. But um, let's see here. So my, my point there is that, let's just go back. And I know this, I wish this uh, green line was easier to see. But you look at this. The CPI gets up to 19.5% here. And it plummets. It not only plummets, but it goes negative. It goes negative to deflation. To, you probably can't see this, but it's negative 2.9%. And we had negative real yields to the tune of about 17%. <laughs> and inflation still came down. So you can argue and say, oh, well, George, that was way different because of blah, 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 blah. Fine. Uh, I don't know that it was that different. But uh, the, the point is, just because you don't take uh, rates positive, real rates positive, Fed funds, it doesn't necessarily mean that inflation is just gone 
that, that, that unless the Fed can get positive real rates, I mean, we're in hyperinflation in the next six months. I mean, we're, we're Zimbabwe by 2023. The Fed can't raise rates. If they can't raise or the, the Fed can't take rates positive, and if they can't take rates positive, real rates, then we're, we're, we're Venezuela in the next six months, guaranteed. nonsense and i'm not saying this isn't a great question because it really really is I'm, I'm just saying that people really have to look at history and they have to look at what has happened in the past um you know weimar germany should just look at that i mean i think i i posted a tweet there the other day it, it's super super simple all you guys have to do is just google inflation uh, weimar germany chart and you'll see from uh, I, I, the exact dates, I think it was about the middle of, of 1919 to the middle of uh, 1920, right around there. There was about a year period where prices actually went down. That, that the German mark that was in the process of, of, of hyperinflating, or at the very, it was in the process of really, really inflating or losing purchasing power. And then it was obviously at the beginning stages of hyperinflation, what turned out to be hyperinflation, from that year or that nine month period, it actually appreciated in value against gold. Now, are you gonna tell me that's because uh, Weimar Germany took interest rates positive in real terms? No, not even close, not even close. Well, how did it happen? You see, the, the point is, is, it, 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 you don't have to have it. It's, it's not a mandatory precondition. Does it help? Absolutely. And have we seen that a few times, you know, going back to the eighties and whatnot when Volcker did it? Yes. But it, it doesn't mean that that's the only way that inflation will, will not go straight up in a vertical line is if we, uh, or that's the only way to prevent inflation from going straight up in a vertical line is to have positive real rates. That's not what history shows us. If I sell a piece of land and hold a five-year or 10-year term, 6.2 owner's contract, what's the risk I face? Not much. As long as the, the contract, as long as you're the, the lien holder, um, I mean, if you're the lien holder, it, it's it's a win-win because uh, especially if you know the property, obviously you do, you own it. And if you know how to market it, you know what its selling points are, you know, your downside is that they don't pay. Okay. Then you keep their payment, you keep their down payment, you keep any payments they've made and you get the property back. <laughs> Pretty good, actually. Uh, and then... If they keep paying, then they sell it and there you go. So it, now you got to have a good contract and sure it's going to be a pain in the ass if they do default because you're going to have to have legal get in there. And, you know, you're going to have to account for that. And it's not like you immediately get the property back. And the, the good news is uh, it's land. So they really can't destroy it. And by the way, anything they built on the land, you would keep. So or any improvements they made to the land would just, you get to keep that. So I don't know if I, I, maybe your question is more so about like macro and economic ramifications, but um, as far as just that setup and doing a, a, a seller finance or whatever, uh, I think that's a, a pretty good play. Uh, let me make sure that that's what you're asking here. What risks? Oh, okay. So maybe you are more talking about macro. Um, so five, ten years at six point two five. I mean, your your downside is that we go through some significant inflation in three, four, five years. I mean, ten year, you, you're. You're, you're betting that we're not going to get inflation of over 6.25% for 10 years, and it's already at 7.9. So 
that's <laughs> that might not be uh, that might not be realistic. I mean, I'm someone that thinks inflation might go down slightly in Q3, Q4, but I still would. I mean, if, if longer term, as you guys know, I, I think we'll get some inflation, especially we get a CBDC, and which I think is a matter of when, not if. Um, that I don't know. I don't know if you've got. Yeah, boy, that would be. I don't know if I take six point two. It depends what their down payment was too. And it depends how long you've owned it. Depends on how badly you need the liquidity, all those things. But um, yeah, 6.25. I know that's probably a good going rate. So the seller is going to be like, or the buyer is going to be like, hey, I'm paying you a good interest rate for, for what mortgage rates are right now. But unfortunately, our mortgage rates are heavily subsidized. So it's tough to go on that. Or they might be paying off LIBOR. Um, those are my thoughts, Jason. I, I, I can't, I don't know. I don't know. It, it depends on how badly you need the liquidity and, uh, what, what are you going to do with the money? I mean, do you have a home for the money right now? Do you have a, a, a better investment? What's the down payment? These are things I would ask myself before I can come to a conclusion. Thoughts on buying Russia? I like it. <laughs> I, I like it. Uh, I, I, I'm not saying buy. Uh, it's not investment advice. Definitely on my watch list because uh, that that's when you buy, man. When, when there's a, a war and it looks like everything's going to hell in a handbasket, uh, that, that's when you get stuff cheap on sale. And, you know, Russia, as far as from a macro standpoint, they look great. Great. I mean, talk about just commodity driven, super low debt to GDP. Um, they got a lot of things going. Obviously, they have problems, but um, you know, everything is a matter of price. And if you can get something a dollar for fifty cents over there because of war, um, definitely would be on my watch list. You do one of your live explanations on inflation on certain countries on what I call the gambling board. Oh, this one? Uh, no. <laughs> I, I, you guys can't see it, but my computer's got hooked up to this uh, this whole setup here. By the way, my editor, Thomas, just hooked me up with some uh, sound effects that I can start using on the live stream. So I'm really excited about that. I haven't used them tonight because in order for me to hear them, I have to have headphones on. And we, we don't have headphones yet that fit this. Uh, I've got one of these Rodecaster Pros, but if I play one, you guys can probably hear it. So I've got, uh, I had to get The Rock on there. The Rock's one of my favorites. You guys ready? So if I do something like, uh, like when I say, uh, oh, like on the Rebel Capitals channel, if I conclude with, uh, make sure that you're always standing up for freedom, liberty, and free market capitalism. After that, I can do this sound effect. Did you smell what the rock is cooking? There you go. <laughs> I didn't hear it. Hopefully you did. <laughs> so I got that one. And then uh, if someone asked me a stupid question, I can do this one. Hey, user. <laughs> and then I got to have Greta in there because hearing her uh, just cracks me up this one. How dare you? And then we've got Homer Simpson. You got to have that. No! And we'll, we'll probably add like three or four more. But so definitely stay tuned to the Rebel Capitalist channel because not only are you going to have the awesome privilege of hearing me talk about the news on a daily basis, now you'll be able to hear me talk about the news and incorporate absolutely, absolutely ridiculous sound effects because at the end of the day, I am a. 13 year old in an adult's body. 
And that's just me being honest. <laughs> uh, all right, guys, I'm going to wrap it up there. I got to shoot over to Rebel Capitalist Pro. So let's do some shout outs. Who do we have here? We've got Gun Girl Prepper. Gun, yes, Gun Girl Prepper. Go viral. Eric Anderson. Nobert Tarlowski. Travis. Uh, uh, Alucard 610. Paul. Daliwal, Glenn Godfried, Moody in the house, Johnny Midnight, Jesse Jesse, Rick Quinn, Evan GD, Eric Cuddle, Michael Lefevers, JF Sebastian, J Rob B, Macro Anarchy, Jerry, No Wado, RR Tom Wasserman, Anthony, Bloodbath McGrath in the house tonight. Wayne Smith, did I say Wayne? Wayne Smith, Rod Mula, KB, Robert Kim, High Brass, Robert Booker, Jorge Guzman, KB, Mitchell Goslin. All right, guys, enjoy the rest of your evening. And as I said earlier, always stand up for freedom, liberty, free market, capitalism. Why? If you smell what the rock is cooking. That I, I see I've got to get the timing right. I, I don't have the timing right yet on the sound effect. Just bear with me. I'll get the timing here and they'll get a lot funnier and a lot less lame. <laughs> All right, guys. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. We'll see you in the next video.